Welcome back to the Meeple Marathon. Uh, today we are going to be continuing our coverage of Legends of Sleepy Hollow. And in this video I'm going to be talking about how to set up and play the game. Um, I want to emphasize um, that this uh, there's very little content here on how to set up the game. It isn't even covered in the uh, how to play manual. Um, this thing here, this, this how to play guide, has no setup section. Here we're talking about assembling the miniatures, component overview, and then here we are, how to play guide, key concepts, winning and losing, using the storybook, and then playing the game. Literally, nothing about setup. Now some of the stuff is pretty straightforward, but uh, some of it is not, so I had to uh, review some of the you know videos put out by the publisher uh, as part of the Kickstarter in order to just get a handle on how to set up this game. So it's a little frustrating how uh, lacking the manual was. I'm going to get off my soapbox now and let's just talk about what needs to be done to set up. So you're going to be getting out your uh, storybook here and at the beginning of the storybook it's going to give you an overview of each of the characters and basically it's going to tell you to take card one and two for each characters with their initials at the beginning uh, and Jeremiah gets a third one he gets uh, a totem or a relic right off the bat that you can see up here then you're going to turn to this guy now there is a setup guide here that tells you how to set up the game board for the game but even that is was still lacking some information. So I'm going to set that off to the side and just know that that's there. But let's talk about um, what you need to know um, beforehand. So we're going to come back to the, the storyboard. Let's talk about our characters. These are the first things you're going to be setting up. And there's no discussion about what you really need to do with your player boards other than to gather these cards, sticking your skills. Technically, you should, uh, you're should you meant to display them like this in an arc above your board. Uh, I have them turn like this just because they were much easier to read during gameplay. But you can see that each person has a skill. That's pretty straightforward. And then each person has a seeker card, which you're supposed to keep to yourself. But since I'm playing solo and controlling all four characters, I know everybody's dirty little secrets. All right. What they don't tell you, however, is that you should go ahead and take a number of action tokens equal to the action uh, number on your board here. So the health is pretty explanatory. You should turn the dial on your character to the health listed. Uh, and then your actions, you're going to put a number of red discs into this uh, little cutout here equal to your actions. And then your movement is how many spaces you can move uh, when it's your turn. Most everybody gets five tokens here except for Emily. What that means really is that Emily is faster than everyone else. It doesn't mean she is limited in her number of actions because once you have moved all of these tokens out into all of these action spaces and onto your skill cards to take actions, you then, as soon as this spot is empty, you bring them all back. And that means that this skill card now is open again. These uh, basic actions can hold as many tokens as you want. That's why they're kind of big open wells. Whereas this skill card here, you can see uh, only has one spot for an action token. Um, it cannot take a fear token, has to take an action token. So that skill is not available until she cleans off her board again which means she's actually going to be able to go through her skills and clean them off faster. So she's like the fast. Don't think of her as you know limited in her actions. Think of her as the fast one uh, because she has less tokens she has to put out before she can gain them all back. All right. What they then also don't tell you is that some of the characters each have a specific token or tokens to them that you want to have handy at the start of the game. Matthias here gets this bullet, uh, at least that's what I'm calling it here, uh, which says attack priority high or low. You really just kind of need this near his board somewhere. I stuck it here, but you can see that he has tactics here where he can flip this and whether his attack priority is high or low, 
he can do more damage, um, things like that. So there's benefits to either side, but you have to completely take an action, you know, spend a turn changing that tactic. It doesn't say, and it doesn't even tell you to get that out, um, so it certainly doesn't say whether you get to just choose at the beginning of the game what your attack priority is. So I just went ahead and picked one, um, and then if I wanted to change it, then middle of the game I spent that uh, action. Also for Elijah here, who has the ward action, he can place um, these ward tokens, which look like this, onto the board. Now I've only got two, the game comes with six. I'm assuming that there's gonna be other skills that he's gonna be able to put them out on the board, but essentially if you put one out, to keep it out there, you have to continue taking fear yourself. Um, so I can't imagine him really having a whole lot more of these, at least at the beginning, other than two. Really, all you need is one. And then last but not least is Emily here. Uh, I'm assuming that these little standees, I don't know why they needed to be standees, are for her tracking her prey. So she can designate um, a specific type of enemy as her prey, and she will basically do more damage to them um, throughout the game when she attacks them. To change her prey, similar to changing... Um, Matthias's attack priority, she has to spend an action to change it. So again, I wasn't sure, do you start the game with one of these out in front of her? Or do you have to spend a skill to pick one and then use that skill to change this? Again, that's not covered anywhere. So uh, Jeremiah is the only one who does not have a special kind of the token that he needs to have. He does have a third card though. He's got his relic, which gives him additional damage overall and um, more health. So that is your player boards here. You don't start with any yellow on your player boards. Each one of them has a number of red discs equal to their action number here. And that uses up all but one of the action discs in the box. So there's not going to be any added actions or anything like that, to my knowledge. I think they just gave you one extra in case you lose one. Or I could be completely wrong and everybody should get five. Uh, but then why would she have this as actions four and everyone else has actions five? So, anyways, maybe she could earn one down the road. Who knows? Maybe there's one person. All right. So let's talk about um, the other components we have here around the board. We've got a little pile of fear tokens. You're gonna to want these handy because you're gonna be taking fear to complete actions, to add additional damage, but also anytime you take damage, you're also gonna take a certain amount of fear. So have these handy. You don't need a super big pile right off the bat, at least for the first scenario, but you want them nearby. Um, also these lock tokens here are just meant to show, even though you only have one skill card each, they're meant to show that right now you only could take two skill cards into a scenario at a time. You're going to have to remove this down the road in order to wield three skill cards. That's all these are for. All right. You've got your three uh, kind of minion action cards here. They're all set to level one. That's covered in the uh, scenario book. And so pretty straightforward. It tells you to tuck them under the board. So you can't see the upper portion, but as you can see, this game is already a table hog in and of itself because you need room outside of these boards to place your skill cards, to place things like relics. You will be finding items uh, throughout each scenario, uh, which are scenario specific. So you want room to place cards here off to the side. And on top of that, you're gonna need room to lay this down. You know, because you're going to be placing markers along this track here and this track here, you're going to want to be able to see the attack priority and review the map at any given point in time. So, you know, you got to figure out where all this fits when you start putting stuff out. Building the map is pretty straightforward. Um, unfortunately, there is no indicator on these that says, you know, this is map tile one, this is map tile two, three, and four. You basically just have to look at the picture and go through your tiles until you find the four that can make the picture you see in the book. I feel like that was a big oversight on their part. Could have easily just added in a number or a letter in the corner uh, to, to make setup more straightforward. It's also going to give you a certain number of uh, creatures to spawn at the beginning. 
All right, so we've gone ahead and put those guys out, the Gopkin and two Shriek Roots here. And it also shows you where all the spawn points are going to be. And then it says to place a lock token on the spawn points that aren't available yet. At this time, spawn one is the only one available. Well, I don't know what, there's no lock tokens. Uh, nothing is listed as a spawn lock token. There are these spawn tokens. And so what I have done is just left off the ones that are not active yet. One's the only one on the board. And throughout the scenario, you will be instructed to unlock, you know, uh, spawn point five. That's when you need to look back at the book and put, I think spawn point five was either here or up there or something like that. You put that out because throughout the game, you're going to spawn creature throughout each scenario. You're going to be spawning creatures. And if their spawn point is not available, you just move down until you hit one that is available. So right now you can see if any monsters get spawned onto the board, they're all coming at the entrance to the schoolhouse right where we are. Okay. They're also going to tell you to take these pumpkin tokens and place one each on top of each one of these kind of pieces of paper. That's explained nicely, and then it says you, uh, if you're in the same space as a monster, you can pick up this token and draw a card from this search deck, and you're basically looking for five keys, right? Um, and. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with this. These symbols are very clear on the board and I'm fine with a token just being placed on top of them. So that way you know that this has not been searched just in case you get confused throughout the game. And this this setup worked. Uh, essentially this scenario has, I think 23 cards to it and it tells you to take cards one through 12 without looking at them, shuffle them up and then just create a draw pile. So every time, you know, each one of these tokens has a card uh, for it. So, you know, each time you play this token here, you could draw card 1-7 or card 112. It's going to be a little different. Um, so shuffled in here is, you know, the times it tells you to add a spawn point, some of the keys you're going to find, uh, some random items, things like that. But they are mixed up and there's a little bit of variety uh, if you want to play through a scenario again. Um, other than that, you don't really need any other tokens handy. Uh, there's a lot of tokens included in the game that you would add during setup, uh, whether it be scenery tokens or you know action tokens or things like that. But unless instructed to do so during setup, you can put all the rest of them back in the box. You will need a certain number of you know minions out uh, because you're going to be spawning those out uh, throughout the game. But then that's it. The last thing that you want to, again, I, I covered this earlier, and I'm just going to lay this down here because there's really no place else to put it and get it in the shot, is to have this book handy. And they don't tell you what to put here or what to use to track these or what to track. But this thing here, which is just a cardboard standee, is meant to track your uh, adversary phase. All right. And this really fancy one is meant to track your spawns, spawn list. I don't know why they bothered to make one fancy and one cardboard. It just seems off to me. Um, why couldn't they have just made a one like this that was just a little wider, you know, bigger circle to track this and then the skinnier one to track this? I don't know. It just seems weird that we've got one fancy one. I know this was like a unlock as part of the Kickstarter, but how could we not have unlocked with just one more piece of plastic um, to get one here? But what you're going to be doing throughout the game is moving these down. As you spawn, you'll move this one, and you don't spawn every turn, enemy turn, but as you do, you'll see, okay, we need to spawn three pumpkinlings, and then the next time, one shriek root, and this just keeps track of which thing you should be doing. Same thing with this, uh, the first round, your enemies are going to move, then attack, then you'll move this, then the next round they'll move, attack, and then you do a spawn phase, and then move, attack, spawn phase. Something to note, and I spoke about this in my unboxing, and I just did not know uh, that there was a difference, 
is if you have the uh, Kickstarter edition, I don't know if these are going to be included in the retail edition or not. You have these cards that are like cardstock squares. I thought that these were nice inclusions to not have to keep the whole board out or the whole book out in front of you. This is much easier to fit on the table, but this is not the same. See, this is chapter one, Pervasive Fear. Um, and you can see that there is advanced rules and ultimate rules, which make the game harder. But also these spawns are different than these. You can see that the first spawn here is three pumpkinlings, whereas if you're playing here, it's one um, gopkin. And this is spawn, move, attack, move, attack, move, attack, spawn. So again, here, like you're spawning things, then they get to move and attack. So this card is different than the book. So unless you want to play on hard, keep these cards in the box. All right. So that pretty much covers setup. Let's now talk about how to play the game. And this, again, was, I feel like somewhat covered in the rule book, but not very well. So on your turn, uh, everybody, basically all of the heroes are gonna go to take a turn and that with all the legends, sorry. All the legends are going to get to take a turn and then all of the minions are gonna take their turn, all the enemies on the board. So you get to choose, it's a cooperative game. You could decide who gets to go first when it is your turn. There are a few things that you get to do at the start of your turn, but basically your turn is going to consist of a movement and an action. And you are allowed to interrupt your movement to take said action and then continue your movement. So keep that in mind. That's a rule that changes from game to game. This one does have interrupted movement. All right. The two things that you can do at the beginning of your turn, one is that you're going to check to see, do you have any tokens in this pool here on your player board? If this is empty, you're going to want to draw everything back. Technically, at any point in time you uh, empty out your pool, um, you're supposed to bring them back. But you always want to check and make sure there should never be a point where you don't have an action token or a fear token um, to be able to take an action. All right. Now, it is something to say that if all of these are out and say I had spent my time resting and blessing others and taking my basic wrath attack action and the only token I'm left with is a fear token, this is still a token, all right? This is not empty, which means I have to use this to take my action this turn, but I cannot use it, for example, here. That's a red circle. I need a yellow star outline in order to take use this. You can always use fear or action tokens on your basics. Um, so you would have to take a basic action. At that point, then you can clear everything back off. I do really like this mechanic. Um, it's a smart mechanic. Um, it uh, is unique compared to a lot of you know dungeon crawlers out there, which essentially is what this game is. Um, and and so I'm I'm uh, I'm really digging this so far. But you always want to start at the top of your turn to check and make sure that you don't need to bring everything back. You also at that point can swap out any relics. So throughout the game. Uh, throughout the course of the campaign, you're going to be obtaining other relics that you can keep, and you have the ability to swap them out from, you know, say, I'm not sure if accessories are always there or not, or whether you just have to keep a hand of cards. Again, that's not covered in the rule book, and I'm assuming, I'm hoping it's going to be covered in the campaign book at some point, but it does tell you that as part of your turn, you can swap out relics. You cannot swap out skills, which is telling me again, this is. Uh, not covered in the rule book, but I'm guessing at some point I'll have more than three skill cards. And for example, here, I have to take this action to restore one ally, restore four to me, and then I may swap one unused skill. So for example, if I hadn't used this, I could swap it with something in my hand. Again, you don't need to worry about that in your very first game because you only have one skill to uh, available to you. But those are the two things you can do before you even take your turn. Then once it's your turn, you can either choose to take your action first or move. Your movement is the amount, the value listed here. So Emily here has four, I'm pretty sure everybody else has three. There may be some uh, like 
uh, clothing or accessories that can increase your movement but for now you basically just get to move and movement is it looks like you know like this is one space and this is one space no 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 this is all one space where I am in the doorway with all four characters right now is one space what you have to do is look at the direction of the boards on the floor now what they're going to do how they figure this out when you're not inside a schoolhouse where there's wooden floorboards I don't know but like this for example is one giant space in the middle of the board so when you move you simply just can go one two you can you know move diagonally so these are four different spaces right here and then this is one big one um, you cannot pass through things that are obviously blocking um, you know line of sight or something like that and you basically just move again you can stop your movement to take your action and then um, continue so movements pretty straightforward just knowing that like this is not four spaces this is one big space does make a difference you can very quickly go like here here and here in three movements you can make it all the way down to here or here um, because this is all one space once you have uh, taken your movement or if you want to take your action first or split your movement up you basically have to then take a token from here and choose what do you want to do so an environment action is changes from scenario to scenario in this specific scenario an environment action picks up one of these tokens to draw a card and figure out whether you've found a spawn point or a key or an item or something like that um, you know and everybody's basic actions are slightly different except for their environment everybody kind of has um, you know this one where they can change their skill but Elijah here is our healer so he can you know restore himself and his allies which means removing fear and or giving health back um, or you can choose to do your skill remember you can only use your skill once until you then refresh your board Either way, it's pretty straightforward. You just kind of are going to read through the card or read down the action. Um, restore, again, is giving you or an ally the ability to remove fear and or gain health back um, in the amount. So, for example, here it says one restore to an ally and four restore to you. So with four restore, Elijah could remove, say, two fear off his board and give himself two health back. Say he took a big hit earlier took some fear took some damage he could do it in a mixture of his choice or one restore to an ally um, you know if Emily here had a fear she could get rid of it off her board it does not say whether or not the restore abilities to an allies have range or line of sight rules or things like that again th this just is not covered in the rule book um, I haven't done a deep dive into BGG yet they may be discussing this stuff um, I know that they have come out with an errata. I have not read it yet, but um, you know that essentially is the restore action. Most everyone else's is pretty much an attack action, uh, other than their specific ones like changing your attack priority, tracking, changing your prey, um, taking a deep breath. Um, Jeremiah can refresh his skills cards without um, refreshing his whole board. So, uh, but he's again has to take a skill to do that. Attack is pretty straightforward, but there's several things you need to pay attention to when you go to attack. So let's look at uh, 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 Matthias here, for example. He's got hip shot, which is just one damage. So if I were to take this action, I would simply do one damage to the enemy. Keep in mind, some of them, like the Shriek Root, has defense one, so one damage isn't doing anything to the Shriek Root. Um, but here you can see if you have attack priority, he could, he may gain, he could take a fear in order to add plus three to his damage. So now he's hitting for four, but he has to have his attack priority set to high. Now, he also has down here damage bonus, plus one die, plus one damage, because he's using his pistols. Eventually you're gonna cover this up with something else. But for now, anytime he does damage, he gets to add plus one to it. So the basic is now a two, if he adds this, three, it's now at five, but he also gets to add one die. So anytime you see die, 
you take one of the pumpkin dice, not the lone D6 that's orange. You take one pumpkin die and you roll it. In this case, I got a two pumpkin heads, so you're adding two damage to that. So if this was our action and he took hip shot and took one fear, the one fear, my apologies, would go in here. Um, he's doing a base of five plus his die roll, seven. He's now doing seven damage if he attacked the Shriek Root. You would subtract one for the defense, and you're hitting the Shriek Root for six. It's got five health, so it's automatically, it's in one shot taken off the board. But that's how you take actions in the game. Again, you're going to be finding items. Those items are going to have slots for action tokens or maybe fear tokens. If you want to use that item, you take your token and you place it on the card. That's your action for your turn. Some of these um, allow you to take more than one action per turn. For example, Emily here can change her attack priority, her prey, and then take a fear to take another action. So, um, you know, and here he can take a fear to take another action when he changes his tactics. So, again, you're taking on fear to do so, but there are ways to take more than one action in a turn. But your basic turn is going to be one movement or you know movement up to your movement value and one action but that's it you know as you go through the campaign your characters are going to grow in what they can do but for right now it's pretty basic the actions you can take once everybody has gone you're going to then give the monsters a turn so let's bring this book back here and again we we covered on this briefly but if it's the end of the first turn you're going to pick this up and move it and say, okay, the enemies will move and attack. It does not say who has to move first, so I'm assuming you get to choose. But essentially, then you look to the card here. And, uh, for example, the Gobkin can move one. All right, so it would move. Right now, it's not going to reach anybody because it can simply just go here. Um, but if it were here and it could move up into this space with all of us, then it's gonna attack somebody for one die roll plus one damage. So in this case, it would have rolled two pumpkins plus one is a three. Now, who does it attack? Well, that's when you can then look to the attack priority here. He would go after Jeremiah first. If Jeremiah wasn't in that space, he would then go to Elijah, so on and so forth. Um, the Shriek Root, you can see, is just one die. The pumplings are a little different. They're going to do direct damage equal to the number of them on the board, but you really, they all kind of attack as a group. So, um, you know, when you spawn them, you can see you're going to be spawning several at a time, and they kind of, they're like a mob uh, type of enemy. But that's it. Um, then, then after the second round, you would move this over, you would move all enemies, attack with all enemies, and then you would do a spawn phase. In this case, you would pick this up, you would say, all right, three pumpkins. That's when you take your D6, you're gonna roll it out, and you would spawn them in spawn point three. If spawn point three is not available, you look for two. If not, you look for one, then you circle back around to six. But obviously one started there, so worst case, you're gonna put it at one. And that's it. Um, this scenario book does a good job of you know giving you spawn rules. I guess those could change what your mission goal is environment actions so what happens when you take this environment action on your board and the map setup so this is all fine there's just there could have been an overview of um, this and it's set up in the main instruction book but that's pretty much it um, again this is uh, definitely a narrative driven uh, type of tale so the story and you know the cards that you flip over are important uh, when you move on to scenario two there'll be a two colon one through whatever deck so you'll put that away you'll get out your two deck and you'll flip to scenario two in the book and read through those instructions it may change the level of the minions it's certainly going to change the board things like that and so you just continue on that way but that's pretty much it um you know it's a very straightforward game I think they just really missed the opportunity to uh, explain it to you well and show you that it is an easy to learn game in the rule book. Um, they, they really just kind of are banking on you uh, finding videos, whether it's theirs or this one, to explain how to set up and play the game. So 
If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know in the comment section below. Uh, I'll do my best to answer them at some point here. Like I said, I am going to review the errata and take a deep dive into BGG to just review FAQs, things like that. So if you come up with a question, I may better know the answer once you put it in the comment section. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and uh, stay tuned. We will be doing a playthrough of this first scenario. Since it is a narrative driven campaign, uh, I don't want to give away too much. So I'm not going to be covering the whole campaign on the channel. Uh, we're just going to do scenario one. Uh, there's not too, too many spoilers, but you at least get to see the basic mechanics of the game, how everything works. Um, and you can then better judge whether this is a game for you if and when it hits retail. Um, this was five years in coming from Kickstarter, so I don't know what type of um, you know retail consumption there availability there will be for retail consumption. So we'll see. But anyways, that has been my how to set up and play video for Legends of Sleepy Hollow. Um, once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.